Hello and welcome to my seminar on the CADEC++ framework architecture, which I developed uh, while teaching courses in modeling and simulation at the University of Florida. Now this uh, seminar is based on a webinar that I've given several times under the auspices of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. CADEC, uh, be an open source environment, uh, has uh, attracted quite a few users at industry and academia. And I used it while I was at uh, the Air Force Research Lab developing quite sophisticated simulations, as well as uh, with my company Modeling and Simulation Technologies. Now in these uh, 12 sections, I explain to you the CADEC++ architecture. I will show you how I make use of the quite sophisticated C++ features of polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation to enable such things as modularity, event scheduling, intercommunication between these encapsulated objects, and table lookup. Introducing a stochastic uh, programming using the Monte Carlo technique. Highlighting uh, the advantage of using matrices rather than scalar programming. And promoting the documentation of your simulation. And finally, uh, I'll show you the uh, capability of CADEC Studio plotting both the deterministic and stochastic trajectories. I will come straight to the point and explain to you what is CADEC. Well, that's what it stands for, Computer Aided Design of Aerospace Concepts. It's an engineering tool and it focuses on high fidelity flight simulations of the main vehicle and then interacts with other secondary vehicles. Let's say the main vehicle is a UAV, the secondary objects of vehicles could be things like targets or overhead satellites that providing the targeting. It's an evaluation tool. You do flyout performance, flight envelopes, launch envelopes, and even footprints. And then for flight tests, it's a planning and analysis tool. There you uh, calculate the trajectories before your flight test, uh, do the footprints, which uh, safety requires. And then uh, you do performance prediction, you get the flight tests results, you do data correlation, and uh, you see how well your simulation is working. Uh, you probably will have to make some uh, adjustments to your simulation so that it will represent the real world that you have uh, experienced in flight tests. And a training tool, I used it at the University of Florida to teach these courses in m &S for quite a few years. I also did some real-time integration into flight simulators where we used our air-to-air -air missile concepts and integrated them uh, into flight simulators, combat air simulators, and had pilots fly them and evaluate them against other types of uh, air-to-air -air missiles. There's a whole history behind CADAG all the way back to 1966 with Lytton Industry. At that time it was in Fort Train 4. It was adopted by industry, government, and so on, and also by the U.S. Air Force. I adopted it there in 1978. Of course, it was then still in Fort Train. Developed air to ground, air to air missiles, you see fighter aircraft, hypersonic vehicles, and the computers at that time were the digital VAXs, IBM mainframes, and also IBM PCs that came online very slowly at that time. 
And then in 2000, at the University of Florida, I converted CADAC Fortran into C++. I used uh, the newly minted the ANSI ISO standard 1998, which of course is still the basis of all the C++ uh, uh, and used my, fi my favorite uh, Microsoft Visual C++ compilers. Currently, uh, it is very much used at uh, AFIL, 5 and 6 staff simulations, at the University of Florida, other institutions, and in industry. These are the simulations that you get a, get a hand on. Uh, you just send me an email and I will give you the code. Or well, Many of these are also uh, on the AIAA uh, site where you can download them. So on the left column, it's a type of vehicle. The vehicle objects that fly around the sky and with degrees of freedom. Uh, the Earth, a very important distinguishing factor. And then some special features. So we got a uh, hypersonic ascent uh, vehicle in a very simple thread off over the spherical rotating Earth. The aerodynamics are in drag polars. A uh, five-staff uh, simulation of an air-to-intercept missile. Here we have a missile and the target aircraft. And uh, the air Earth model is the flat Earth model. And we're using trim the aerodynamic table. The cruise missile is also a five-staff, but uh, now with the spherical Earth, it has missiles, targets, and satellite objects. And uh, one of the provisions are remote targeting by satellites. The F-16 is my fighter aircraft in six stuff over the flat Earth. An air-to-ground missile in six stuff, flat Earth. Now this has a weather deck. That means you can now introduce a non-standard atmosphere, including winds and gusts. And that's why we need Monte Carlo. MC uh, because uh, the gusts are modeled stochastically. There's an air to air missile also in six stuff over the flat earth, Monte Carlo capable, and now the hypersonic ascent plane uses a WGS 84 earth model, which is the most sophisticated earth model. Uh, GPS is using that earth model. And here you see we have one object. A plane that morphs into a transfer vehicle exoatmospherically and then into an interceptor. And uh, from the ground, uh, we tr have a tracking radar and the overhead satellite. Now, that is uh, represented by the generic NASA X 30. And again, we have Weather Deck and Monte Carlo capability. Then a generic defense missile. This defensive missile is trying to protect that aircraft from offensive missiles. Since it's uh, a tactical system, again, I'm using the Flat Earth. And it's Monte Carlo capable. Now we go into orbit uh, with a three-stage booster. The rocket with three stages, six stuff, the WGS-84. It has GPS, insertion guidance, weather deck, Monte Carlo. And finally, the air defense missile uh, that uh, attacks a short-range ballistic missile or an aircraft. And it has a radar, a tracking radar, and a, uh, that radar also guides the missile. Flat Earth, Monte Carlo capable. The framework of CADAG is an open source environment. So even though I developed quite a few simulations for the US Air Force that are restricted, but uh, together with uh, the University of Florida, uh, we uh, created an open source framework of CADAG, which is available to anybody. 
and you have free access to a full suite of tools. You can download it from AIAA, there's CADEX Studio, plotting programs and stochastic analysis programs, and then a bunch of C++ simulations. Uh, it runs on Windows platforms with the Microsoft C++ compiler. Well, I mentioned that uh, I introduced uh, CADAC in 1978 at the universe at uh, AFRL, uh, jointly with the University of Florida. There are other universities that are using it. Uh, you see here Missouri University, Industry also Lockheed Martin, uh, another university in Australia, in India, in Argentina, in Israel, and finally the uh, in Jap in Japan uh, the uh, NASA of Japan called JAXA. So as you go and use uh, CADAC, you will need some resources that uh, will uh, get you started. And also as you model your various vehicles, you need some help. And here's the textbook that uh, I created quite a few years ago. I think the first edition was in 2000. Now we're in the third edition. Also, I mentioned, taught some courses in modeling and simulation at the University of Florida, an inductory course introducing the student to C++ uh, is used in aerospace simulations, then the fundamentals of SIG stuff and the advanced SIG stuff. And that course, advanced course, made it advanced because it had GPS, INS, it had common filters, it had uh, SAR radars, and I'm using this hypersonic vehicle to uh, introduce all these advanced concepts. Now my company, uh, Mass Tech Modeling and Simulation Technology, uh, has published an undergraduate textbook which introduces you to tens of light dynamics uh, with very little prerequisites. And the second book is more advanced. Uh, it is a solid booster that uh, takes a payload into low orbital conditions. I also more recently uh, created four workbooks and you see here from left to right more on C++, uh, more on TensorFlow Dynamics, a very collection of missiles and rocket simulations and then a flight dynamics workshop of more general nature. Also, uh, recently uh, I uh, published courses at Udemy, which you can take. As you see, a flight dynamics with tensors, how the tensor formulation of flight dynamics leads to programming with matrices. And then uh, a more in-depth treatment of C++, how it is used in aerospace simulations. Another seminar, just like this one, uh, I uh, published on YouTube. It's called Einstein and Flight Dynamics, how Einstein's covariance principle leads to the tensor formulation of flight dynamics. Well, uh, this is a seminar, but originally, as I mentioned, it was a webinar. In a webinar, you could ask the students some questions. <laughs> One reason was to uh, make sure that they're awake or wake them up again. <laughs> so here are some of the questions. Now, um, are you a student, aerospace engineer, software engineer, scientist, manager, or maybe just human? That's okay, too. Now, unfortunately, you can't tell me that right here because this is a one-way video. But if you like, uh, you can send me an email and let me know uh, what kind of student or what kind of uh, engineer you are. So that's all, part one. Thank you very much. 
Building a computer architecture is like building a house. One first starts with uh, the requirements. In our case, uh, these requirements translate into a class structure of our CADAC++ simulation, the blueprint of any C++ simulation. Our vehicles are the main objects derived from a class of hierarchies. And with all this in place, we can run our CADAC simulation. Like uh, any architect, the requirements have to be specified before he can start a building. And uh, there's no difference with uh, building a new simulation architecture. So uh, that's why I started uh, my uh, CADAC++ architecture which is a constructive simulation by specifying requirements. Well, uh, this uh, architecture should have a synthesis capability for multiple vehicle environments. High fidelity simulation of the main vehicle and the lower fidelity for the supporting vehicles. And I used that example of a UAV. The UAV would be the main vehicle and the supporting vehicles or objects would be targets or overhead satellites that provide the targeting to the UAV. Now in order to have multiple vehicle instantiation uh, these vehicles have to be encapsulated and this is the strength of C++. It is the binding of data and functions and restricting their accesses. Of course, that's what we call classes. Then uh, the simulation should have a modular structure to mirror the vehicle's components with strict interface control, which then enables the reuse of code. And as any uh, sophisticated simulation, there are multiple phases of flight. Just think of that UAV coming off the aircraft with wings folded and then the wings deploy after it clears the aircraft. So that would be a new event because the aerodynamics and mass properties now change. So uh, that's another requirement. Uh, and uh, since these individual vehicles are encapsulated because they are classes, we need a global communication bus so we can uh, exchange data between these objects. And since we are in the aerospace world, uh, there are always aerospace tables. Uh, there are aerodynamic tables, there are propulsion tables, there may be mass property tables that have to be uh, provided. And it is good to keep them separate because uh, sometimes these data have to be uh, protected, uh, maybe for proprietary reasons, or maybe they may be classified. And then, in order to uh, duplicate as much as possible the real world, there has to be a Monte Carlo capability, that is, introducing uh, noisy sources. Just think about uh, uh, atmospheric uh, turbulence or seeker noise, or INS uh, instrument errors. And in order to model that, uh, we need uh, different types of uh, uh, stochastic uh, distributions like uniform Gauss, Rayleigh exponential, and even Markov distributions. And I'm much of a f in favor of uh, writing code as compact as possible and that is made possible by programming directly in matrices, and therefore we need matrix utility operations. And then last but not least, documentation is important. Uh, if you have a uh, simulation that you want to hand on to somebody else, you need to document. And document all the interface variables between the modules. Certain checking has to take place. And uh, it has to be made possible and compatible with CADEX Studio for plotting. 
well, the class structure in C++ tells you much about uh, the code that's, uh, that you're looking at. And uh, here is the class structure of CADAC. On the left-hand side are the classes in a short description. We got CADAC, which is a base class of a hierarchical class structure of vehicles. Then uh, the class vehicle is hosting a pointer of type CADAC, and I have more to say about this later on. Module, we talked about module, variable, those are the uh, module variables that uh, form the interfaces between modules. I talked about events, and uh, in the communication bus, uh, we store the data with packets. And that's why we have the class packet. And then uh, we come here to the table lookup. There are two classes that support that. Data deck hosting a pointer of array table and the storage of the tables actually happens uh, at the uh, class table. For uh, Markov uh, data uh, introduction, uh, we need to have a class Markov that stores those data. And they talked about the matrix uh, operations uh, that require a separate class. And then document class uh, provides storage of module variable definitions. So we're going to go through these classes uh, pretty much uh, one by one. And I will explain then. Well, vehicles are encapsulated objects. And each aerospace vehicle is an object declared by its hierarchical class structure. And as you're familiar with C++, you know that classes uh, encapsulate data and methods. And they are not accessible by other classes unless uh, there are special provisions made. And the data are aerodynamic data, propulsion data tables for us, and vehicle characteristics are computed in the module functions, which are the methods of the particular classes. The class hierarchy starts with the abstract base class CADAC. And the abstract base class requires derived classes. And in the first level are the equations of motions. And in the second level are the vehicle modules. And we'll have some examples here. Cruise missile, fighter aircraft, hypersonic ascent plane. You see here the CADAC base classes, which is... Uh, the starting point for each of these hierarchies. On the left-hand side, round three, these are the equations of motions over the round three Earth. Flat six, the equations of motions over the flat Earth in six degrees of freedom. And in the case of the hypersonic ascent plane, uh, you see there's a mixture of equations of motions, round six, round three, and even on the ground. <laughs> And then derived from those are the actual vehicles, like on the left-hand side, crews, that would be a UAV, the target, the satellite. In the case of the fighter aircraft, it's a very simple hierarchy. There's the plane. In the case of the hypersonic ascent plane, there is the hyper, which is the hypersonic plane. Uh, there are satellites overhead, and then there's a ground radar. When you execute CADAC, uh, you have uh, certain inputs. You have an input file, input.asc, that initiates the run, and the, all kinds of uh, variables are set there. Then you have the modules, which are uh, code files and the header files. Uh, they are compiled and uh, result in a executable. And uh, on the right-hand side, there are additional input files. In our case, 
usually aero decks and propulsion decks. So the program executes now. There's output uh, to the screen and to plot files, to trade files, and to statistical files. And all those can be processed and displayed in CADEX Studio. So that's about it, uh, about the architecture. And since we're talking about uh, computer languages, now my question is for you. What is your favorite language? Well, my favorite language right now is C++. Way back then it was Fortran. And I've been working with Python, which is a simpler version of C++. Uh, and of course English, uh, <laughs> that's my foreign language. So my mother language is German, as you may have guessed from my accent. And uh, you tell me what is your favorite language. Again, you can send me an email. All right, that's all. Thank you very much. Polymorphism takes a big slice out of the C++ pie. P-I-E standing for polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. The power of polymorphism is particularly evident in runtime polymorphism, where its implementation streamlines the code and speeds up the execution. Let's uh, look now at this implementation of this uh, very advanced feature of polymorphism to our CADEC++ architecture. Polymorphism is the capability of C++ to use many forms, that's poly, with one interface, that's morph. And I'm going through these now very carefully because uh, these advanced features are rather difficult to uh, catch right away. Now there are several examples of polymorphism. You can have overloaded functions, overloaded operators, virtual functions, runtime polymorphism, and I'm using all four of these features in my CADEC++ architecture. And we use uh, runtime polymorphism because what's called the power of late binding. And let me go through these three points carefully. The virtual function call is determined by the type of object pointed to by the pointer. And we'll get uh, more clearance on uh, what that pointer looks like. The pointers to the derived objects can be stored in one array of the type base class, which in our case is CADEC. Why do we do uh, runtime polymorphism? Well, the late binding reduces code complexity, makes for more compact code, and that's what we all like. So let's get into the details. This runtime polymorphism uses inheritance and virtual functions. So what is a virtual function? It is a member of the base class and may be overridden by a new function of the derived class. That's what you read in one of the C++ introductory texts. Here's the procedure. Build a branching class hierarchy and then dynamically allocate memory for an array of pointers to the objects. And of course our objects, what are they? Well, they are like uh, the UAV, the target, the satellite, and so on. And the array pointer is of type base class. 
which is our CADEC class. And here is the code to dynamically allocate the memory with that uh, keyword, C++ keyword, new. And you see size will tell us how many of these pointers are there. And then place the objects, our objects, our vehicle objects, into the array. Now what happens at runtime? As one of the pointer array elements accesses a virtual function, the correct version of the virtual functions corresponding to the object pointer will be called. And that is the miracle of runtime polymorphism. And the class is called abstract class. If at least one of its functions is purely virtual. And this abstract class, in our case CADEC, cannot be used to create an object. The benefit is that the program morphs during execution without a large amount of contingency code. Well, but it slows down the execution, but that's a very minor point these days. So let's implement it. And here on the left-hand side, these are the two classes. We need CADEC and its hierarchy and vehicle class. All right, all vehicle objects are stored in the pointer array vehicle pointer of type CADEC. And we just saw how that pointer is created. So first create vehicle, vehicle list of class vehicle, which has a private mem member, the pointer array CADEC vehicle pointers. So this is a point array, that's why we got these two asterisks there. From the input file, input.asc, read the number and type of vehicle objects. And then finally, add the vehicle pointers to the vehicle point array in the order read from the input. So these are the three steps. And I give you some time to absorb that. Now, during runtime, the vehicle objects are accessed by their pointers. And the class vehicle, which is the second class on the right, left hand side, declares an overloaded offset operator. And here, on the second one, you see how that works. It's of type CADEC. It's an operator with the brackets. And that returns the vehicle pointer. And the vehicle pointer is of the correct vehicle type. In our case, like cruise, target, satellite, and so on. And though it is stored in the pointer array of type CADEC, and that's where polymorphism comes in, with this vehicle pointer, the member functions of the respective vehicle are accessed. And here's an example where we're going to access the Newton module. And you see here on the left-hand side the vehicle list I is uh, the I is the vehicle, and uh, it accesses the uh, member function, which is a module called Newton, which as one of its parameters has the integration step. Okay, so uh, this is quite a mouthful. i give you a little time uh, to look at this once more. Now we're going to look at a particular example, our cruise missile architecture. See the base class, derived class, and 
derived classes. Round three is the equations of motions over the round rotating Earth, and we got target, cruise, and vehicle, and satellite vehicles. And each of these uh, objects now has a list of module variable arrays. These are the interfaces, so they can talk to each other within the respective hierarchy. Then we have these uh, methods of the individual classes, which we call functions. Well, these are actually the virtual functions now. Newton environment uh, in round three. And then uh, for the vehicles, we got aerodynamic propulsion forces, targeting, seeker, guidance, control, intercept. So these are the virtual functions, or we also call them module functions which are methods of these individual classes, target, cruise, and satellite. Now these uh, are then instantiated and uh, we're gonna give those vehicle objects names, target three, cruise three, and satellite three. Each of these branches are isolated. They don't communicate with each other. Therefore, we need this communication bus so that, for instance, if uh, the cruise, which is our UAV, with its seeker wants to get the target coordinates in order for the seeker to lock on, we have to provide in the simulation the target coordinates through the communication bus. Now, that's not the way the real world works, because the seeker just acquires a target. But in this simulation, because of our C++ encapsulation of the individual objects, we have to provide that data over the communication bus. And here is a display of these individual modules for that particular example. Of course, each uh, CADAC simulation has different modules depending on its particular structure. So how do you feel about polymorphism? Is it too difficult to understand? Well, it takes some time to get used to it. You've got to go over this one again and again and I encourage you to take my course at Udemy that goes in more detail, particularly if you want to get to know it better. But it is certainly best for multi-object modular simulations. And multi-object means not just that we have multiple ve um, different vehicles like a UAV, target, and satellite, but each of these individual vehicles can be multiplied. So we may have multiple UAVs attacking multiple targets and uh, overhead multiple satellites. And that's really how the real world works these days. We call these net-centric simulations. And yes, maybe my brain is numbed and without feeling. Well, if that's the case, then go back and review it again. Thank you very much. Modularity is a very important concept in the CADEG architecture. It establishes the one-to-one -one relationship between the hardware components and the simulation modules. And I will demonstrate that to you in several aerospace examples. Let's see now how CADEC implements modularity. Well, we are using two more of our classes, and those are module and variable. So we mirror the hardware components of an aerospace vehicle. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between 
Such things as aerodynamics, propulsion, actuator, guidance, and control. And it's important uh, that you have control over the calling order. And that is accomplished in the input file, as we will see later. Now, the modules actually are methods of the individual classes, uh, and uh, they are therefore encapsulated. But within a hierarchy branch, they can communicate with each other through module variables. And they are the own interface and strictly controlled. And uh, in order to uh, implement that, uh, we reserve a certain number of arrays of these module variables. And to keep it all straight, uh, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the module variable name and its array location. And for documentation purposes, so all those uh, interface variables are recorded in the file that's called doc.asc. Now this module variables, which are the interface, can be of the type int or double. And they can be uh, arrayed as 3.1 vectors or 3 by 3 matrices. And inside a module, these module variables are first localized in the function, and after the computations have taken place, they are loaded into their array location for other modules to use them. So here are some examples again. Uh, this is the fighter aircraft module structure. You have seen that before. The class hierarchy is very simple. And uh, there's flat 6, which are the 6 degrees of freedom equations of motion over the flat Earth, and then the plane itself. And each of these classes have associated with it uh, these uh, arrays called flat 6 and plane. Now looking at the modules, uh, those are the very familiar ones. We are solving Euler's and Newton's laws. These are the six degrees of freedom equations of motions. They are driven by the forces which in turn are obtained from propulsion and aerodynamics. And the aerodynamics are modified by the actuator through uh, the controlled surface deflections. And the actuator is uh, controlled by the autopilot, called here the control module and then there's a guidance module and so it loops through there uh, every integration step. A little more complex uh, system is this hypersonic plane modular structure. Well it consists of the sixth of hypersonic vehicle. Again you see the equations of motions, oil or Newton, forces, Propulsion aerodynamics, now there's an RCS, reaction control system, there are actuators in addition, control, there's an INS system, guidance, seeker, there's a GPS system implemented, and star tracking to update the INS, and then there's a data link. On the right hand side you see the left branch of that class hierarchy, round six are the six degrees of uh, equations of motions over the WGS-84 Earth, and then hyper is the actual hypersonic vehicle. Now there are other branches, uh, two more branches, uh, one for the satellite, and the satellite uh, is uh, co computed by equations of motion over the round rotating Earth in three degrees of freedom. And then we have this ground radar. And you see that there are additional modules required for the satellite and for the ground radar. 
So that's a, a three branch hierarchy, which is um, probably my most complex system that I ever have built. Now within the module, and here we're using it, the Newton module as example, there are three functions, def Newton, init Newton, and Newton itself. In the def Newton, uh, that's where we define these module variables that we're using in this module. Init, mod, init Newton, uh, that uh, occur uh, initial calculations, and then uh, we're looping through the uh, equations of motion in the Newton module, and that happens every integration step. And here's an inside look abbreviated into this module Newton. So here are typical definitions. I selected a few of them. And if you want to read them across, you see there's a name, a initial value assigned to it, the definition with, of that particular variable long x, which is the vehicle longitudinal in location in degrees, the module where this uh, variable is defined in, the type, is it a diagnostic, is it a state variable, or is it something else, and then uh, what are the output options to the screen, or plotting or COM, which is the commutation bus called COMBUS. So this is here the first function of this Newton module called DEF Newton. Then here, uh, I'm skipping the init Newton. Uh, we're here already in the Newton module itself. We first are getting the module variables from that array to make it local for the function to be available. Then computations take place. And later on I have to say something about uh, how we do most of our computations. They're actually here in matrix form. We're integrating in matrix form. And you see here the function integrate. I do inline integration. It's a uh, second order Newton method. But I'm not going to go into more detail than that. And finally, we are loading those computed module variables into the array back again to, ma to make available at other modules. So again, uh, we have a definition of the module variables that are used here in this Newton module. We're loading down module variables of this array to make available locally. We do computations and then we load it back up again into this module array called round three. So um, that's a very short tour um, of the modularity in CADEC. And here are the questions again, well, why do we do modularity? Yeah, to mimic the hardware, to exchange components, nail down the interfaces, and all three are true. And, uh, well, are we making life easier? That's up to you to determine. And you can let me know whether that is true for you. So thank you. 
any aerospace vehicle sequences through events, or in the case of boosters, we call them stages. So uh, we have to implement the event scheduling, and these events are initiated in CADEC in input files. An event in my simulation is declared by its own class called event. Just think about aerospace vehicles like rocket ascents, aircraft takeoff, missile launches. All those are divided by phases and initiated by events. Rockets have three stages, so each stage has different mass properties, different aerodynamics, different control and guidance systems. Aircraft takeoff, cruise, landing, missile launch, mid-course, terminal intercept, and so on. So these events in CADEC++ are interruptions of the trajectory for the purpose of reading in new module variables. That's the definition here. And uh, these events and the numbers of them, uh, you need to globally dimension by these capitalized keywords, NEVENT and NEVAR. In the input file, you introduce these events by this event block. It starts with if and ends with end if. And you've got a watch, watch variable, a relational operator, and then the value itself. And then you introduce these new module variables. And the relational operators are either less equal or greater than. So let's have an example. Like a seeker is enabled at a range to go of 8,000 meters. How does that look like in the input.asc file? And here's the answer. If that distance to go, dbt, is less than 8,000, then the flag mseek is set equal to 2, which means now the seeker is enabled. And, and if... Uh, completes uh, this event code. So it's time now to look at the input file and we'll use the cruise missile as a typical example. So we got a title, we got some comments, and we got an option line and this option line controls the output, the screen to the communication bus whether you want to display the events, whether you want to write out a file of what's on the console, whether you want to plot, whether you want to have the trajectories plotted, whether you want to merge any of these plots, and whether you want to document. And then come the modules, and here is the sequence of the calling of the modules. And if you change those sequences, uh, they will be different, but it is kind of important uh, how to line them up. Environment, aerodynamics, propulsion, forces, Newton, targeting, seeker, guidance, control, intercept. And then comes the timing of the implementation. The step size to the screen, to the plotting files, to the trash files, and the very important integration step size. So here we're going to have four of these displays uh, covering the whole input.asc file. Now we identify how many vehicles there are and there are going to be three because we have a UAV, one target and one satellite. And then come the initial conditions. Long, lead, altitude, angles, speed, incident angles. The aero deck is called here, called Cruise 3 aero deck, and then the propulsion deck is called and loaded up into the simulation. Then we got seeker guidance and autopilot details, which I'm not going to show here, but now I'm going to these event stages. And in this case, we're crossing a waypoint. 
So if waypoint number one is crossed, we're going to read in new waypoint coordinates. Change the heading and the altitude command. And if waypoint two is crossed, something similar happens. And so for waypoint three. And finally, uh, as the seeker locks on the target, the seeker flag is set to three. Now that is the UAV vehicle, but we have another one, the target on the ground that the vehicle is to attack. It's called target three. And again, we give a long lead altitude, a heading and a speed. And then we have a satellite also initiated with long lead altitude and heading, flight path angle, and the speed. And finally, everything is over. Uh, we identify how long we want to run this run, 300 seconds, and then stop. So that's the input file, which shows our event scheduling as an example. When you run that file, you get console output. First you see a block of variables that are going to be displayed in block form. And in this case we are displaying the UAV information. And I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm showing you down there the event that occurs. Missile overflies waypoint at longitude, latitude, and we give the time and the miss distance. Uh, and so on, some other information, and then there's another event, and so on and so forth. And this is the result plotted in CADEX Studio of this UAV trajectory from launch all the way to target, going through these three waypoints. And on the right-hand side, you see some of the detailed information in long lat. And you also see that uh, we're cruising at Mach 0.7. And uh, we acquire the target with a seek, and then uh, the UAV homes into the target. All right, uh, we have come to the end of events. And now I'm asking you, what is your preferred format for input data? Well, some simulations uh, put the input data all into the code, but I sure like to keep it separate. Some simulations have a GUI to make it real easy for the user, but with the GUI, the user loses some of the connection with the actual simulation. And way back when uh, in the Fortran, Fortran days we have a name list. Well, my preference is to have a, a separate input at ASC file. Thank you for paying attention to events. The encapsulation of objects in C++ prevents the data exchange of our vehicle objects. So we need a communication bus called Combus that allows that to happen. And that process we call publishing and subscribing. Now I will show you the tricks I had to use to enable communication between the encapsulated vehicle objects. Well, because they are encapsulated, they prevent direct data exchange. And I use the communication bus Combus, which gives global access to the module variables of all vehicle objects. And Combus is of type packet. Packet is the class that supports Combus. So how do we build this communication bus? Well, the module variables are flagged by the keyword COM. And here's an example in small print. And you see the keyword COM on the right-hand side. 
and that happens in the definition. Now every vehicle object publishes or loads a packet of COM variables. And these packets are stored in the array Compass, which is of type packet. And how do we use this communication bus? Well, it can be used by any vehicle object. And a particular vehicle object subscribes, or we can call it download, the variable it needs from the other vehicle objects. And I use this example of the UAV that needs to have the target coordinates in order for its seeker to lock on the target. That's the prime example here. Well, Combus is an array of type packet of the size equal to the number of vehicle objects. The slot number of a vehicle in Combus is the same as in the vehicle list. So there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. And here is a graphics display. Let's say we got the two cruise vehicles and two targets, and they publish their packets onto Combus. And then the cruise vehicles subscribe to both of these target coordinates. So each cruise vehicle subscribes to long, lead, and altitude. So we talk about publishing and subscribing. And that's what our Compass does. It enables the communication about these encapsulated vehicle objects. And uh, each branch of our hierarchy does not know of each other. So that's why we need this Compass. The vehicles publish selected module variables by using the keyword COM. You already saw that. Every vehicle object of the same type, multiple instantiation, like uh, we have UAVs, targets, satellites, publishes the same module variables. And as an example, all vehicle objects are derived from the round 3 class and publish the same round 3 module variables because the round 3 class calculates the equations of motion for the UAV, for the target, and for the satellite. Now we subscribe. But it's complicated by the fact that the subscribing vehicle object is unaware of the publishing vehicle. So we need some logic. And here's the methodology. The publishing vehicle must be identify its combo slot. In this case, it would be the target. Logic is required to select the publishing vehicle from all other vehicles. An example is to pick the target, which is the publisher, when it is in acquisition range of the missile, which is a subscriber, and then build the publishing vehicle's ID. And now you've got to find this ID in Compass and thus determine its slot number. And then you can download the module variables from the Compass data packet. On the console, we can display the content of Compass. And I have shown you this here for Cruise 3, Target 3, and Satellite 3. And you see here we got Mach number, long leg, altitude, velocity, heading angle, the three positions, the three velocity components, and so on and so forth. And we got that the same thing for target and for the satellite. Okay, and that's all about communication. But without communication, nothing happens. <laughs> that's true in C++. Well, nothing happens 
amongst the encapsulated objects, I must say. And we know that from experience, uh, our recent COVID-19 isolation, encapsulation, we could call it, we needed to communicate either by email or by Zoom or what have you. And the hardware and software, they communicate all the time with each other. Now, if you don't like any of this, uh, go on an island far away in the sea, and then you are excommunicado. Let me know if that's you. Thank you. Any aerospace simulation worth its salt requires tables, like aero tables, propulsion tables, maybe mass property tables. So in a CAD egg, I provide one, two, and three dimensional table lookups. Here I will limit myself to show you how to use the one dimensional and two dimensional tables. Table lookup requires two classes. Uh, they are called data deck and table. Well, you're well familiar with aerodynamic and propulsion decks and uh, usually they are one, two, or three dimensional tables. And I'm using a linear interpolation uh, between the points, which is quite adequate. What are the desired features of table lookup? Well, you want to keep these data decks separate from code to protect them and to make adding or deleting tables simple. Some other uh, C++ uh, architectures actually uh, put the tables right into the code, but I rather prefer to keep them separate. And here's my architecture. I encapsulate data and methods that is made possible by the C++ architecture features. And the tables are stored as tabular data in the class table, which enables it, and uh, the class data deck hosts a point array of type table. And the tables are accessed by these pointers stored in these arrays. And then I'm using the lookup function and overload it so it can be used for one, two, and three dimensional table lookup. And here is the lookup procedures. The tables are located in files called these here, both arrow and prop data. And in the input.asc file, they are identified by the keywords arrow deck and prop deck. And uh, we have seen that input.asc file earlier, and I showed you there how these arrow and prop tables are identified. Now this function lookup is located in the utility functions and carries out the interpolation. During uh, initialization, these tableau data are read and stored. Uh, in main, opens the input file, input.asc file. For every vehicle object, the function vehicle data is called. And in this uh, vehicle data, the file name of the arrow deck is read and the file is opened. Then the function read tables is called, which reads and stores the tables. During integration, uh, the function lookup uh, is overloaded, as I said before, one, two, and three dimensional table lookup. And there are two steps in the interpolation procedures. First, finding the index of the discrete independent variable like, for instance, Mach number, with a function find index. 
nearest and below the input variable and then conducting a linear interpolation with that function interpolate to the next data point. At the extreme points of the table, extrapolation is constant at the upper end and linearly sloped at the lower end. And that's really driven by the aerodynamic tables. So here is an example of a one-dimensional table lookup. You see the name of the table, in this case it's CDO versus Mach number, so that would be the drag versus Mach number. There are two key words, uh, one dim identifies the one dimensional tables, and NX1 has the number 6, which tells us how many independent entries there are. In this case it is the Mach number. And then on the right hand side are the values for the drag coefficient at these respective Mach numbers. Now in uh, the module aerodynamics uh, we are looking up the drag and we're going to be using aero table which is an object of class data deck which calls the method of that class data deck, and that is the function lookup. And the parameters are the name of the data deck, and this is the same name we have seen up there, and the independent variable entry, which is Mach number. So given a particular Mach number and the name of this table, uh, we're getting the drag at that particular Mach number. Now for two-dimensional tables, uh, let's get a little more complex. Uh, again, we got the name here. In this case, it's the thrust available versus altitude and Mach number. And we got two independent entries. The first one uh, is the altitude. And the second one is the Mach number. And then uh, the actual values are given here on the right hand side. So that's a uh, 3 by 4 matrix, which is uh, the thrust available as a function of altitude and Mach number. And again, uh, in the propulsion module, we use the function lookup. Now it's overloaded, so it also works for these two-dimensional tables. We got the name here as a parameter, and then the two independent uh, entries of altitude and Mach number. And I also have one three-dimensional table lookup, but I will spare you the details here. Well, this is all. On tables, uh, what tables have you dealt with? Uh, if you have built simulations, very sure that you worked with aerodynamic tables and propulsion tables, possibly even mass property tables. And if you haven't dealt with any of these, you certainly have been at the breakfast table to eat your breakfast. So thank you again. And I will see you next time. Computers love to chew on matrices. And with C++ providing me with the capability of overloading operators, I can create my own CADEC utility functions, which I will demonstrate to you how to code the equations of motion in pure matrices. Let's see how the Monte Carlo technique is implemented in CADEC. It is an important technique 
of experimental mathematics. Matter of fact, it's using statistical mechanics, nuclear physics, and genetics. But uh, we here we just use what's called the direct simulation method. And we use it to study the response of nonlinear systems to random inputs. And our simulations are certainly nonlinear systems. So we make multiple runs, drawing values from stochastic distributions, and then obtain a large quantity of output for post-analysis. In our Sixtoff sims, uh, we have many noise sources. I mentioned turbulence already, INS, sensor, aerodynamic misalignments. And uh, these are with distributions like uniform, Gaussian, Rayleigh, exponential, Gaussian, Markov, and Dryden. Now, there's good news. The central limit theorem asserts that output are merely Gaussian if there are many noise sources. And yes, in our six stars we got plenty of noise sources. And our output uh, is then uh, expressed in univariate or bivariate performance criteria. And these are all based on Gaussian uh, assumption. Univariate means we calculate the mean, the standard deviation, sometimes the CEP. And bivariate means uh, we're calculating and displaying error ellipses. So how is it implemented in CADEC? All right, these, we got to model the noise sources and uh, we have to determine the uncertainties and environmental disturbances. And we do repetitive runs drawing random variables from stochastic distributions. And it is in the input file that the number of runs and the random number seeds are provided. And you see here the example in input.asc, we have this keyword monte, 20, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here we're making 20 repetition with the random seed being this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And our random variables are identified in input.asc by these keywords, uni, Gauss, Rayleigh, exponential, and Markov. And for initialization of module variables, those keywords are being used. Now these are just uh, for initialization. However, during runtime, we are using a distribution called Markov, which is a Gaussian correlated noise source. And in order to implement that, uh, we need a class called Markov. And uh, once we make a run, uh, these results are recorded and collected in stat.asc files. And you uh, initiate them by using in the option line the yes stat and yes merge. Now these are large files and uh, we need help to analyze them and that is being done in CADEX Studio where those large amounts of uh, data are analyzed and displayed and you will see some examples later on so here are the distributions uh, and uh, i assume that you're pretty much familiar with these uni is the unit uh, distribution uh, you use the variable name and assign a min and max value gauss you need the mean and sigma Rayleigh is a uh, one-dimensional uh, 
to cast distribution, all you need to set there is the mode, then the exponential distribution uh, requires a density, and this is used like when you have UAVs uh, trying to negotiate over obstacles, and you have to insert the obstacles at a random uh, value. So that's what you use the exponential distribution for. You specify the density, the number of vents that a number of that is the number of uh, obstacles per unit uh, unit would be like range to go, for instance. And then here's the Markov, which uh, provides noise throughout uh, the simulation. Uh, it has a sigma square that, that defines the maximum value here in the autocorrelation function, and then the power density function bandwidth is given by this B core. So here's an example of this input.asc file. It's actually a very sophisticated simulation. It's an ascent to either the space station or to an intercept. And I want to point out uh, this Monte keyword here. In this case, we make 100 replications and the random uh, number initialization of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then uh, you see down here in GPS measurements, we have a Markov process for the user clock, frequency error, we got a Gauss distribution for the user clock bias error, another Gauss, and another Markov. We got a star tracker using Gauss for initialization and Markov for the noise source throughout the simulation and an RF seeker. Gauss, Markov, and Gauss again. Matter of fact, we're going to be running this input file and showing you some results. And this is what's happening in that uh, run. The X30 takes off from a runway, uh, delivers a transfer vehicle, exoatmospheric, which then releases a cargo or there may be an intercept, and this cargo is delivered to the ISS. And on the ground, we got a ground radar that provides some of the targeting information. So here is a result of the run plotted over the globe, and that globe option is available in CADEX Studio. So you see, we're taken off. Uh, from Cape Kennedy, and uh, then you see where the rendezvous occurs. And this is uh, the time sequence of the trajectory. And you can spend some time uh, looking at this. Uh, I'm plotting versus time, such things as altitude, Mach number, and the inertial velocity. And then I have also given these various events that occur. And for the down, we're interested in angle of attack. And, well, angle of attack is even defined in space where there is no atmosphere because it's the angle between the velocity vector and uh, the first body axis. And you see here, exoatmospherically, that angle of attack jumps around. That vehicle is making... Uh, quite a many uh, pitches and yawing excursions in order to provide the thrust in the right direction for the rendezvous. So if we were to intercept satellites, here is an example of two intercepts of two satellites, again featuring the uh, CADEC uh, capability of having multiple vehicles and multiple satellites. In this case, uh, there are multiple X-30s releasing multiple transfer vehicles, releasing multiple uh, intercept 
Atlas and attacking multiple satellites. Well, that multiple in this case is two. Now, since we do want to make an intercept, we're interested in uh, the accuracy of the intercept. And that's where Monte Carlo comes in again. We have made Monte Carlo runs here, 100. And now, on the left-hand side, uh, you see the plane. Its coordinate axes are given on the right-hand side. These are the so-called hill axes. And uh, the uh, missed distances are recorded in the 1H and 3H coordinates, which are normal to the flight path angle. And if you are very carefully looking at the left picture, you see some very faint uh, green impact points. And then the CADEX Studio uses those to calculate the error ellipse. Well, in this case, the CP is about 5 meters, and uh, somebody else has to decide whether that's good enough or not. <laughs> All right. So here we are in Monte Carlo. It's a substitute for the real world. And yes, it's a good way to model the real environment. Uh, now, maybe you don't want to gamble even in simulations. Well, then your simulations just will be deterministic. Or I would say I would rather visit the real Monte Carlo, and yes, I have visited several times, but I never spent a single dime at the roulette. <laughs> All right, thanks again, and I will see you shortly. Computers love to chew on matrices. And with C++ providing me with the capability of overloading operators, I can create my own CADEC utility functions, which I will demonstrate to you how to code the equations of motion in pure matrices. Now I show you how to overload operators in order to manipulate matrices. And this is an example of operator overloading. And we do this by defining so-called operator functions. And here is uh, the code snippet here. We have a return type, the class name, and then the keyword in C++ called operator, and the uh, pound sign is a placeholder for any C++ operator, with a few exceptions. And then there is a uh, parameter list and some additional information in code form. So, the operator function defines the operation that the overloaded operator performs. And that is most useful if you have a new class, like in our case, the class matrix. So let's go for an example. And we're going to use the multiplying operator. This is here the splash, or the star if you want so. And uh, we're going to apply it uh, to multiplying two matrices. So here's the prototype. The uh, return is a matrix. The class matrix calls this overloaded operator. And then uh, in the parameter list is the other matrix, B which is uh, used by a reference. That's why the ampersand. All right, here's the usage. We got uh, three matrices. And here we uh, assign them memory. So now A mat, B mat, and C mat are objects of type matrix. 
And in order to multiply them, we just uh, write it as if it were a scalar multiplication. C mat equals A mat times B mat. So what's actually happening? Well, that's shown below there. C mat equals A mat and A mat, the object calls the operator function to multiply. This parameter B mat. So, uh, as I say down here, A mat, the left operand, is the object which initiates the function call operator. And B mat is the right oper operand, is the argument of the function. And uh, what that operator returns is the uh, multiplication of A mat times B mat. Well, if you're not really familiar with C++, that may be somewhat uh, strange or Greek to you. But uh, those of you that uh, know C++, you understand how operators can be overloaded and in this case used for our matrix class. And there are a bunch of them. On the right hand side are all these overloaded operators. Multiplications, additions, uh, subtractions, and even some uh, relational operators and so on. And on the left hand side are additional matrix utilities that I'm using in my CADAC programs. Well, here's an example of how I program these matrices. Now, the example is uh, the aircraft translational equations of motion, which uh, follows from Newton's law. So, on the left-hand side, we have the uh, time rate of change of velocity of center of mass B with respect to the Earth expressed in body coordinates. On the right hand side there is the uh, skew symmetric form of the angular velocity, that's a capital omega, of body frame B with respect to Earth frame E expressed in B coordinates, multiplied by that velocity and then 1 over mass, aerodynamic and propulsive forces in body coordinates, and a transformation matrix of body with respect to local level, which are our Earth coordinates at this time, and multiplied by the gravitational acceleration in these local coordinates. So in red below is the equivalent in code. And you can just see this one-to-one -one correspondence and I'll just let you read this here. And then we got to integrate, of course, because we have the derivative on the left hand side, and the integrate function accomplishes that. And uh, so now we have integrated to the next step integration. The rotational equations of motion are shown here, derived from Euler's law. And on the left hand side we got now the angular velocity in uh, 3 by 1 matrix form of B with respect to E. And the derivative expressed in body coordinates. And then the inverse, on the right hand side of the equal sign, the inverse of the uh, moment of inertia tensor multiplied by here the negative of the angle of velocity in skew symmetric form now. That's here a 3 by 3 matrix. And uh, additional terms, moment of inertia, angle of velocity, and here I have included some of uh, the rotor engine angle of momentum. Uh, like from a turbojet or even from a propeller-driven UAV, 
and the MB are the aerodynamic moments expressed in body coordinates. Again in red you can see the one-to-one -one correspondence with these uh, matrices that I expressed above. And also we got to integrate again to reach the next integration step. Well, uh, this is very useful, uh, these matrix uh, manipulations, because you don't want to write out these equations in scalar form. Uh, if you do this very often, errors creep in and it's just a waste of time. So that's why my uh, approach always is express as much of the equations in matrices and then program it directly using our matrix class of uh, variables. So I love matrix programming. It's effective. I love it. But maybe you hate it. Or maybe it's only your computer who loves it. But the world without matrices would be just a scalar world. And a sorry word. <laughs> world. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So you uh, want to document your simulation. And CADEG will give you all the helps that you need. And it does additional error checking. And all that information of these module variables that represent all the interfaces is located in this file called doc.asc. We have come to our last class in CADEG, uh, which is called Document. It is used to document the uh, module variables. And that's where the emphasis lies on these module variables because they govern input output, the tra data transfer between modules and special diagnostic needs. And I'm using this uh, principle of uh, one definition and multiple use. So the module variables are defined in the modules, and then that information is used both in the input.asc file, and altogether the module variables are collected in the doc.asc file. And it is this class document that enables all this. And then I do some error checking making sure that uh, these uh, matrix uh, computations are com compatible and checking uh, the file stream openings. And then a very important one, uh, which is uh, to make sure that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between module variable name and one array location. That's what's being enforced here. It's very important to avoid uh, confusion so that signals go astray into some other variables where they're not supposed to be. And that's what you may be called to document, and I provide you uh, this package of information that you can use readily. You just uh, provide the uh, code of the modules, and particularly the definition codes, and then the input.asc files, and finally the doc.asc file with all the module variables. So let's look at some examples here. Well, we're here in uh, the function def newton. That's where all the variables are defined for the newton module. And this is a method of the class round three. And I've blocked out here as example long, lat, and altitude. You see the locations are in round three. 
variable array of 19, 20, and 21. On the right, right hand side, then uh, they are initialized with zero. They are given a description with the units. And then I'm showing that they are defined in the Newton module, followed by uh, the fact that, that they are used in initialization and also as diagnostics. Well, in the case of the altitude, uh, we also use this as an output to other modules. And finally, uh, the uh, control of the output, output to the screen, to the plot file, and to the communication bus, which also can be displayed on the console. So that's the definition. Now in the input file, these uh, three examples are shown here, and you see that we have picked up uh, their description with the units and uh, the module in which they are defined. And you see some other examples further down here. And finally, uh, in the doc.asc file, I show you these three variables again. The locations 19, 20, 21, the name, then the definition with the units, modules where they show up, the purpose, why they are there, what they are used for, and then the output the direction. So this is the use of um, the definitions of these module variables. Yes, so uh, why do we hate documenting? Well, maybe it's not exciting, maybe somebody else ought to do it. <laughs> Treasury, a necessary evil, the boss makes me do it. Or maybe you love it. And I must say, I actually like uh, documenting for two reasons. <laughs> One, if I have to pick up that simulation again in a few months or a few years, I really need the documentation to find my way around again. And of course, in order to pass it on to others so they can use it and understand what's in there. All right, uh, thank you, and uh, we just have one more to go. CADEX Studio provides you with all the help you need to analyze and promote your product. You do it with two-dimensional plots, three-dimensional plots, or even plots over the globe. And what you already have seen is how to analyze and display the stochastic results in CEP and error ellipses. A plot is worth more than a thousand numbers. So let us plot with CADEX Studio. And there are many options you have. There's a two-dimensional plotting option. You can plot up to three variables in two frames, and you can plot multiple vehicles. Then there's PETA, which is a three-dimensional plotting program, Cartesian coordinates. Up to 10 vehicles can be plotted there. And over the globe, uh, we can do three-dimensional plotting in longitude, latitude, and altitude, up to four vehicles. Charts, just like stri strip charts of the old times, up to 12 traces in one frame. And then the stochastic plotting and processing. You can uh, create histograms with bywire. You can create CEP and bivariate ellipses from scatter plots. And then there's MCAT, where you can determine mean and standard deviations of a trajectory fans. And finally, we use sweep to generate launch envelopes and footprints. So here are the examples. This is K-plot two-dimensional. 
you see here the menu and then uh, the plot which is behind it and in the menu you can select the variables that are all located here on the left hand side and those are all the variables that you have declared in your simulation where you define the module variables as to be plotted and you can populate these two frames you see up to three variables per frame versus time but you can also plot it against other things than time and there are all other options available this is uh, the 3d plotting capability which we call PETA again you see the menu on the left hand side all the variables and you can here plot up to 10 trajectories you can use square grids or Euler and there are many other options you will just have to explore that by yourself And here is a typical plot. What I'm plotting here are two UAVs against two targets. With this menu, you can actually rotate the cube by putting in the angles. And then on the right hand side, there's an option to also plot individual traces against time and finally we have the globe plotting program so here in the menu you can plot up to four trajectories and in the background i'm just showing two of the satellites but they are really the other ones are just hidden. They may be actually on the other side of the world. So these are the plotting options. I already have shown you how to uh, plot the, the uh, stochastic error ellipses and CEPs in a previous uh, discussion. Okay, that brings us to the end of our uh, seminar, and I just have a few concluding words. To we have come to the end of my seminar, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making this video. Fortran is passé and was replaced by C++. I did so in the year 2000, replacing my 1978 Fortran simulations by C++ simulations and call it CADEC++. It's an open source environment of constructive airspace simulations and has been applied to all kinds of air vehicles, aircraft, missiles, hypersonic vehicles, boosters, and so on. And it's used by government, uh, industry, and academia now. I swallowed the whole pie of C++ and that enables me to uh, use CADEC++ for what is called net-centric simulations with many objects flying around <laughs> in the sky and even uh, in the space. So with P, polymorphism, uh, I can use late binding at runtime and as you heard uh, that very much improves the coding and the efficiency of execution. I, for inheritance, such as my vehicles inherit the equations of motion from another class along the uh, line of inheritance and encapsulation. So we can actually instantiate multiple vehicles, many UAVs against many targets targeted by many overhead satellites. So where do you go from here? Well, download CADEC from the AIAA website 
here is uh, the link to my book and you go to the supplemental materials. Send me an email, preferably on the Cox email, but uh, I also once in a while look at the Gmail. And you can get additional C++ simulations. Yes, and there are two courses. If you are interested in tensor flight dynamics, take the first course. And if you want to continue with the seminar, go much deeper with my C++ in aerospace simulations. And I have published four workbooks at Amazon, as I have shown you at the introduction. Now it's up to you to tell me how you liked that seminar. Send me an email. Was it boring? Met your expectations? Exceeded your expectations? Oh, maybe you can't get enough. Well, if you can't get enough, then go to my course. <laughs> and here is the goodbye. I hope you enjoyed our time together. Drop me a line. And cheers from the Sunshine State. And uh, the picture you see here was taken when I gave the webinar about eight years ago. So farewell and keep on programming. <laughs> <laughs>